I must flip here in less monetary and go immediately to the debt and the deficit, as Heilbronner would have called it of years ago, of this nation. You and I celebrate the life of Pete Peterson, one of our leaders, in saying, watch out for the debt, watch out for the debt. And yet we went on and on, $155 billion in 1987 when you took over a stewardship of the Fed, and now we're out to trillion-dollar deficits. When do they really affect America? Sooner rather than later. But the important issue is until it becomes obvious that there are consequences to that, such as inflation beginning to emerge, the political system does not respond because confronted with a choice of increasing spending and cutting taxes or the reverse, it's very obvious that the vast majority of the Congress and the president usually uh, come out in favor of what I would call loose fiscal policy, and Pete would subscribe to that 100 percent. Why have we not seen that fear of inflation, the fear of higher interest rates yet? You've always been more balanced about an inflation Easter. You've never been the doom. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. But why haven't we seen it yet as we've migrated from 400 billion, 800 billion, and now trillions of dollars? Uh, there's always a considerable lag involved, and it depends to a very large extent uh, on what the state of politics is. Uh, when you have, say, a conjoining of Republicans and Democrats on a specific policy, almost irrespective of what the data are doing, that gets implemented. But today, we have the most severe differences, differences uh, that I was, about, I was about to say that I've seen back to the Civil War, but uh, I've just been part of a book, uh, co-author of a book on the e uh, economic history of the United States. So I'm steeped in the history, and I can tell you there's been nothing like this in American history. Does the debt and the deficit limit or compact, contract the degrees of freedom that any central banker has? Uh, to the extent that it impacts on the money markets, which it invariably always does, then that is a critical issue for central bankers to be concerned about. You don't speak about Fed policy. That's always been your approach, Mr. Volkers, as well. And in, in others, I don't want you to speak on Chairman Powell, but we have a monetary theorist now as vice chairman replacing Stanley Fisher and Richard Clarida of Columbia. What does the monetary theory now bring to the debate of central banking? I don't think I could give you a standard one which everyone had agreed upon, nor would I argue that it is necessarily the right one. But the general focus now is on what is the equilibrium interest rate. It's an old concept which goes back very many decades, centuries, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's nothing new out there. Uh, all I can say is uh, when I was Fed chairman, uh, it wasn't ev evident to everybody, but what the, the particular statistic which drove where we were going mm -hmm. was a yield on the 10-year note. And uh, the result of that was uh, you got a coalition around those who were forecasting the longer-term structure of inflationary forces. And that, in my judgment, was the ideal way of coming at it. That doesn't mean we could forecast where the 10-year note was going, and mm -hmm. sometimes we did yet into, I mean, there's a thing that came up we called the conundrum. When You called it a conundrum. Everybody else said Greenspan was wrong. <laughs> well, basically what we did is we tightened money and we expected, as history at that time mm -hmm. would have demonstrated, that long-term rates would have gone up. Right. They went down. <clears throat> okay, but we're going to rip up the script here, folks. This is so important with Alan Greenspan. Uh, you know Richard Timberlake and the Georgia School, and of course Ben Bernanke's work on economic history. You just mentioned uh, the new book you're involved in. The arch question is: Can central banks get out front of the debate, or by definition are all central bankers a reactive process where they must react after the fact? No. Uh 
in fact, it's, after the fact, it's a little late by definition. Uh, there are anticipatory actions which the Federal Reserve endeavors to take, and during my almost 18 and a half years, uh, we were very conscious of what the forces were out in front. That didn't mean we could forecast them correctly, but we tried. And I mean, in 1993, for example, uh, we actually created what we thought was not possible, a so-called so soft landing of the economy, which was beginning, to, was beginning to surge, and we put a cap on it and uh, tightened the right. cap until it stabilized. One of the guys before you had a pipe, and he, we just look at the smoke rings to see what they're looking at, mm -hmm. and now we have the Draghi press conferences, the Powell press conferences. Are we giving too much information out now? Is part of the problem with PhD forecasting is we're talking too much about it while we're doing it? I'd want to comment on that. <laughs> you know, you're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. Let us switch gears, and this is an important essay that both Alan Greenspan and I uh, were looking at. And again, we say good morning to all of Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television worldwide with the chairman. And that is a wonderful essay by Mervyn King about the fabric of Europe. And this is within the new populism. And I want to fold it back to the group of seven and the desperation out of World War II to make for a cohesive Europe as well. Are we losing that institutional memory that allowed us to make Europe as one and without war? Uh, it's still there, but it's the forward movement came to a halt with the euro. In other words, I remember very distinctly, I was a part of the G7 group of central bankers and finance ministers, and uh, we periodically would discuss uh, in the late 1990s uh, something which we called uh, a new currency which would essentially integrate all of the major currencies, which mm -hmm. ultimately became the euro. The purpose was political, namely it was a step on the road towards full integration politically of Europe. And of course, that never happened. That never happened. But this is critical with Chancellor Merkel visiting with President Trump, I believe it's on April 27th, is the German exception. We have an ECB, and as Governor King talks about in his Bloomberg View essay, there's that, well, but it can't be a German leader because they're too austere and too driven by a conservative ethos that you don't see from Mr. Draghi or others. Do you buy the cultural distinction that the Germans really shouldn't run the ECB or at least well, be the president? Let's put it this way. The, the Germans essentially are controlling the whole euro system. You're just looking at uh, what might be evidence that northern euro, so to speak, the mm -hmm. countries north, uh, north of uh, Milano, uh, are basically uh, su supporting the countries below. And the way you can see it most generally is not necessarily with only the net exports, which or and if you look at the southern Europe, the southern Euro area, and northern Euro area, there's a there's a flow of funds since the beginning, in from the north to the south. But even more relevant is something which is called Target Two. Target Two is the clearing mechanism for the total all of the Euro all of the Euro banks. And that, of course, it's a zero-sum game. It's a, merely a measure of all the movements of who owes what. Is it a flawed whom. system? Klaus Regling was in today with the ESM. Is it a flawed and broken system? Or does there need to be substantial amendment to the European political economic structure? Let me tell you what the data show, and you can conclude yourself. Right at the moment, you can line up all of the central banks from the Bundesbank out to the Bank of Greece, mm -hmm. uh, by the extent to which they are net borrowers or creditors to the system as a whole. Obviously, the total system must always be a net right. of zero. And what we see now is a credit of over 900 billion <clears throat> euros that have been built up, right. and they are essentially uh, two-thirds 
of all of the gross positives. On the downside is, of course, uh, you, you, would, you would get, uh, I, I would say, a number of different countries, but Italy and Spain would be big. And most recently, the European Central Bank is a negative. Uh, well, the ne these are some of the dynamics. Because of time, Chairman, I want to get back to the arch question in America, which is our debt and our deficit. It is extraordinary the debt growth we've seen within the legislative process and the tax cuts. Would you have passed that historic tax legislation? Well, strangely enough, the tax legislation was not bad in and of itself. In other words, moving the corporate marginal rates down was very important, as Ireland demonstrated back in 1998. Does it skew to a new Gilded Age? No, and the trouble, unfortunately, is it's unfunded. In other words, what they did, where they cut uh, and the regulatory structure mm -hmm. which they changed has been quite positive. But they have not attacked the issue of entitlements, which uh, Pete well, Peterson, you did this, though. You did this 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Is that the immediate task that we must revisit Social Security legislation before the 13 years are over, where that becomes a real problem? Uh, it, we are long overdue on that issue. Uh, one of the reasons, as I recall, that uh, Pete and I would discuss many things, mm -hmm. but what we never spent as much time on as I think we should have. And largely, that should, see, you know, he set up this special fund, mm -hmm. uh, and fund, which is basically the purpose of that, was to confront the issue of deficits. And what he's running into, and what, the, what everybody is running into, is that uh, cutting uh, Social Security or Medicare or anything is uh, the... Uh, uh, I would say the, the most inconceivably, <laughs> I'm trying to find an appropriate word which would describe how important this is. Uh, it, 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 you cannot cut benefits now. Uh, it's the third rail of American politics. I, I want to get this in. I think it's so important. What does the Republican Party need to do to get back to conservative debt policy? Uh, go reread Ronald Reagan, but make a major amendment to it, which is basically do spending cuts first before you try to do tax cuts. Well, we'll leave it there. Alan Greenspan, thank you so much.